March on till victory is won. Oh yeah, let us march on till victory is won. Oh yeah, we're almost there. Say it again one more time. Let us march on to victory. Oh yeah. Thank you, Director Kevin Peabody and your choir for the rendition of the Black National Anthem. Well, good morning, good afternoon, it's a whole night through good evening, and good day to you and you and you and you. Well, hello, everybody. My online family and friends, welcome again to another Sansa show. Well, courtesy of PHLB Radio, Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> well, as you know, today is the first weekend of February and also the first weekend of Black History Month. Well, Carter Woodson was a scholar whose dedication to celebrating the historic contribution of Black people led to the establishment of Black History Month. That's a little education right there for you guys. Well, as Governor Newsom, our governor here in California, good looking guy, <laughs> well, he proclaimed declaring February 24, 2024 is a Black History Month to pay homage to the rich history and contribution of Black Americans who have shaped our state and nation in countless ways through centuries of struggle and triumph. This year's theme, Black Americans and the Arts, celebrates the profound and evolving impact of Black artistry on our culture, national identity, and social movements that have spanned the world over. Through literature, music, architecture, dance, film, and every conceivable medium in between Black artists and intellectuals have used their talents to honor their heritage, educate, and inspire an open minds and hearts. Black art has been a powerful agent of change and social uplift throughout the nation's history. During this Black History Month, let us draw inspiration from this legacy as we continue you know, together on the path toward equality, liberty, and opportunity to all. To honor Black Americans' contributions in history whose names represent legacy of unparalleled achievements paved the way of future generations to come. I gather a list for you guys, some of the most influential people in different fields. First, as you know, to start off is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr one of the most well-known civil rights leaders and who was a Baptist minister and an activist who fought against racial inequality. Dr. King Jr. was a prominent of nonviolence and peaceful protest. He was one of the founders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference called SCLC, which aims to achieve racial equality peacefully a federal holiday on the third Monday each January celebrate his legacy. Next, one of my favorite is Rosa Parks. She was a civil rights activist in Alabama and the secretary of Montgomery chapter of the National Association for the Achievement of Colored People. It's called the NWACP. Rosa Parks is known most for her refusal to give up her seat to a white person on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, which inspired the Montgomery bus boycott. Next, of course, the well-known president, the first African-American president of the United States, became the 44th president of the United States. He was inaugurated 
on January 20th, 20, 2009, President Obama and his first lady, Michelle Robinson Obama, were, pres were married in 1992 at Chicago's Trinity United Church of Christ. They have two wonderful daughters, Leah and Natasha, called Sasha. <laughs> President Obama served two terms. Oh, you know, I'm so proud of that, and made several noteworthy accomplishments. He worked to strengthen the economy during a global financial crisis, championed health care reform with the passage of the Affordable Act, Care Act, Affordable Care Act, and won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009 for his efforts to improve international relations, just to name a few. Of course, we have Frederick Douglass, taught himself to read and write at the young age. After escaping slavery, he became a social reformer, author, public speaker, and a prominent leader of the abolitionist movement. And the ultimate goal of ending slavery and also supported, advocated for women's rights. Miss Oprah Winfrey, yay, my girl, my woman. She was transitioned as a host of the Oprah Winfrey Show, which ran for 25 years into a media and business empire. We invested the profits from her show plus profits from films like The Color Purple. There's a new, new version of The Color Purple, you guys. Beloved and Selma, which her Harpo Productions co-produced and add to an estimated more than $2 billion, not million, billion dollars. In 2011, Ms. Oprah launched a cable channel called OWN, worked to pass the National Child Protection also. Well, next one is Harriet Tubman. She escaped from slavery and spent 11 years guiding other slave people to freedom through the Underground Railroad as a conductor. Harriet Tubman was also a spy, scout, nurse, and soldier during the Civil War for the Union Army. She was also referred to as Moses. Medgar Evers was the World War II veteran and civil rights leader. He was the NWACP's first field officer in Mississippi. He helped lead protests against the segregation of public primary schools, beaches, parks, and at the University of Mississippi. Evers also organized voter registration drugs drives and started new NWACP charters chapters in Mississippi. Next is Jackie Robinson. I, I like the movie too that they made about his life. One of the most influential sports figures of his day as a player for the Brooklyn Dodgers, which broke the color barrier. He became the first African-American professional baseball player to play for the U.S. Major League Baseball team. Well, Booker T. Washington, born into slavery, he overcame many b barriers that were blocking him from getting an education. After his family gained freedom to the Emancipation Proclamation, there were no schools in his area. Instead, he walked 500 miles, you guys, to enroll in school at the Hampton Institute. He, he was the, became the first teacher and principal at the Tuskegee Institute. Next is Shirley Chelsum. Chisholm, I'm sorry. Uh, the first African-American woman elected to serve in Congress in 1968 and to seek the U.S. presidential nomination from a major party. She co-founded the Congressional Black Caucus, which is designed to guarantee equal rights, opportunities, and access for African-Americans and other marginalized groups. Born Cassius Clay. He went to the Philippines, though. He's my mother's, you know, uh, love. <laughs> Cassius Clay, in 1942, changed his name in the early 60s to Muhammad Ali. Woo! He made his name in the sport of boxing as one, one of the greatest three times heavyweight champions of all time and an Olympic gold medalist. He was also a philanthropist, humanitarian, an activist that advocated for civil rights and religious freedom. Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth was born Isabella Bonfrey to a family of slaves 
in Ulster County, New York. She was very like Douglas and Tubman and later escaped to become an abolitionist and activist for women's rights. She played a major role in recruiting African-American soldiers to fight for the Union Northern States against the Confederacy, Confederacy Southern States in the Civil War. Maya Angelou, wow, one of the best known African-American poet, a dancer, a singer, an activist, and an author. She wrote this um, autobiography, I Know Why the, Why the Cage Bird Sings, in response to the abuse that she endured as a child. She used the metaphor of cage birds to express that even though she had suffered abuse, she would survive by fighting back, just as the cage bird will sing even though it is broken. And now, in music and movies, here are some of the most influential figures in our times. Louis Armstrong. Hello, Dolly. <laughs> My favorite. Louis Armstrong grew up in the streets of New Orleans, heavily influenced by the sounds of jazz. Louis was responsible for scat singing and in the 1930s became the first African-American musician to host a national radio broadcast and to tour Europe. To this day, Louis is one of the most influential artists in the jazz world. Uh, Billie Holiday, she was so beautiful, was born as Eleonora Fagan and began her singing career singing in Harlem nightclubs. Soon after, Billie was signed a recording contract, becoming one of the most influential jazz singers known for her technique of singing tempos and phrases. Lena Mary Calhoun Horn was a groundbreaking African-American woman performer, singer, actress, dancer, and civil rights activist. Lena Horn's career spent more than 70 years, you guys, appearing in film, television, and theater. She joined the chorus of the of the um, Cotton Club at the age of 16 and became a nightclub performer before moving into Hollywood and Broadway. Ella Fitzgerald, <laughs> who was often referred to as First Lady of Song or the Queen of Jazz, rose to fame as a jazz singer in the 1930s and paved the way for future generations of black jazz singers. Well, this man, my mom met him, and, he, and my mom was in Las Vegas in the 1950s. Harry Belafonte, wow. He was so excited to meet my mom too, when he found out that my mom is Jamaican. He's a Jamaican-born American. He's a singer, actor, civil rights activist who popularized calypso music. Matilda, Matilda. <laughs> well, for international audiences in 1950s and 1960s. Um, Belafonte career breakthrough album Calypso in 1956 was the first million selling LP by a single artist. Wow. James Brown. Well, referred to as the godfather of soul, I'm trying to think, <laughs> as the hardest working man in show business, was one of the most influential entertainers in the 20th century. James was a part of the music industry for over 50 years, you guys. He was a singer, songwriter, dancer, musician, record producer, and band leader. And known for his such hits such as The Boss and Get Up to the Thing. Get up. <laughs> I'm not a rock and roller. Forget it, Susan. Then Sue. <laughs> I didn't even call myself. <laughs> call my own name. Richard Wayne Penniman, known as professionally as Little Richard, was an American singer, pianist, and songwriter dated from the mid-1950s. His charismatic showmanship and dynamic music characterized by, you know, frenetic piano playing, pounding backbeat and powerful raspy vocals, laid the foundation for rock and roll. Richard's innovative uh, vocalizations and up-tempo rhythm music played a key role in the formation for other music 
genres including soul and funk and rock to hip hop and rhythm and blues. Aretha Franklin, AKA the queen of soul. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> the singer behind Respect. Chain of Fools, and I say a little, I say a little prayer for you. Aretha is known for her powerful, energetic voice. Aretha was in the music business for nearly 60 years, and to his day, remains a true icon and inspiration for many. Ray Charles, in the 1950s, fused the likes of gospel, country, and R&B together, and eventually formed the soul music genre. Ray is known for hits like, I've got a woman, hit the road, Jack. Don't you come back no more, no more. I think something like that. <laughs> Lost his eyesight, but he never allowed his blindness to slow him down. He won 17 Grammys, wrote dozens of songs, and was named number 10 on Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Artists of All Times list in 2002. Well, dumb the greatest guitarist of all time. Guess who it is? I don't think, you know, no further ado there. Jimi Hendrix, career was short-lived, passing away, unfortunately, at the age of 27. He left behind a powerful legacy when that put the electric guitar on the map and forever changed the world of music, especially when he played the national anthem in his guitar. At the age of five, you know who it is, is now. I, I don't think, you know, it's not hard to guess. Michael Jackson. A, B, C. Easy now. One, two, three. <laughs> Became the lead singer of the Jackson Five and landed his first number one record at 11 years old. By 1971, Michael became a solo artist and released his debut solo album, Off the Wall, in 1979. In 1983, during a live performance of Billie Jean, a single off the album Thriller 1982, and Michael introduced the world to his signature move, the moonwalk. Michael is also known as the most philanthropic pop star in history. Now, this guy is so good looking. And I saw him in his concert too. He can play, I mean, really all night long. Born Prince Rogers, Nelson as Prince, dominated the 80s and early 90s. Throughout his career, Prince um, had 10 platinum albums, 30 top 40 singles, and was known for his iconic look and bold stage presence. Prince played the majority of all his instruments. He can play any kind of instruments, you guys, and I've seen it during his concert. But it's most of his music because and because of his hands-on approach, he managed to give a creative power back to the artist. One of my favorite, Stevie Wonder, blinded shortly after his re after his birth. Stevie Wonder is one of the most influential singer songwriters of our generation. Signed to Motown Recording Records at the age of 11, S Steve has had 10 U.S. number one hits, 20 R&B number one hits and sold over a hundred million records worldwide. Whew, that's a lot of records. Tina Turner. Left a good job in the city, working for the men. Rose to fame in 1960s, but the late, the late 1950s, she would become the lead singer of the Kings of Rhythm allowed, alongside her husband, Ike Turner. Tina embark, embarked on a solo career in the late 70s after divorcing his husband in 1978. His debut solo album, Private Dancer, 1984, won three Grammys and sold more than 20 million copies worldwide. What's love got to do, got to do with it? In 1984 is Tina's signature song. Sidney Poitier, a good looking man, who was a Bahamian and American actor film director and diplomat. In 1964, he was the first black actor and first Bahamian to win the Academy Award for Best Actor. He received two competitive Golden Globe Awards, a BAFTA Award and a Grammy Award, as well as nominations for two Emmy Awards and a Tony Award in 1999. He ranked among one of the most American Film Institute 100 stars. 
Sidney Poitier was one of the last surviving stars from the golden age of Hollywood cinema. Denzel Washington. No further ado than that one. He's an American, and he's a junior. I didn't know that. He's an American actor, screenwriter, director, and film producer. He was, his first um, rose to prominence when he actually joined the cast of um, medical drama St. Elsewhere playing Dr. Philip Chandler for six years. He received much critical acclaim for his work in films since the 1990s, including his portrayal as Malcolm X and other real life figures. And also he had received two Academy Awards, two Golden Globes Awards and a Tony Award. He's notable, notable for winning the Best Supporting Actor for his part in Glory in 1989, and the Academy Award for Best Actor in 2001 for his role in film Training Day. In comedy, the two most influential people, figures actually, is Eddie Murphy. is a comedian, actor, and singer who was a dominant com comedic voice in the United States during the 1980s. His comedy was largely personal and observational and a skillful impersonator. He is a very good impersonator. Jamie Foxx is an American actor, comedian, and singer. He rose to fame after starring on the sketch comedy show In Living Color before starting on his television show, The Jamie Foxx Show. He garnered international attention to his portrayal of Ray Charles. He, he was really good in that movie, too, in the film Ray 2004, for which he won the Academy Award and Golden Globe Award, among others. Fox. Jimmy Fox is also a Grammy Award winning musician and released his five albums. His 2009 single Blame It reached number two on the Billboard Hot 100. And of course, the one and only, no further introduction there, my mother, but not the least, the pride of the Philippines, Miss Elizabeth Ramsey that one and only queen of Philippine rock and roll, the very first Jamaican Filipina who broke the color barrier in the Philippine industry. She was a legendary entertainer and humanitarian. To know more about Elizabeth Ramsey up close, you can purchase a book that I wrote about my mother at amazon.com entitled Elizabeth Ramsey, Queen of Philippine Rock and Roll. At this time, um, in the solemn note, it is a heavy heart heart that um, we pronounce the announce we announce or actually announce the passing of Joe Madison. This week he left us and we would like to celebrate his legacy. He's a radio personality known as the Black Eagle, who brought his passion for justice from the civil rights movement to the airwaves. Mr. Madison spent years working with the NWACP before launching his broadcast career and becoming a longtime radio voice in Washington, D.C. Well, Mr. Madison, may the purple light shine upon you and may you rest in peace. And we'll be right back. Hi, everyone. I just want to welcome you again to our new episode and a new segment. And I'm so excited for our new guest today. Um, I have to be serious a little bit, you know, because this is a serious note. Um, let me introduce to you our guest. is a pastor of El Bethel, San Francisco, California. Please help me welcome Pastor Kiba McNeil. Hi, Pastor. How you doing? Good, good, good. <laughs> good evening. How are you doing? How are you? Okay. Um, good. Be serious because you know <laughs> you're, you're a man in the church. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so can you tell us a little bit about your family history? Well, um, I see. I originally I grew up in uh, a little rural town in North Carolina. I grew up on a farm in St. Paul's, North Carolina, and uh, I uh, went in the military and moved, uh, was transferred to California. And after getting out of the military, the Air Force, I met my beautiful wife, uh, who uh, I now am married to. Uh, a few years later, uh, Brenda McNeil, and we have a blended family. Uh, I have two daughters and she has one daughter. So we have three daughters. 
Wow. <laughs> and and uh, is the first lady in the background? <laughs> no, she's upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just what we're doing. <laughs> so I, I, I uh, retired as a parole officer from the state of California. And I've been in ministry now for 25 years, and I've been pastoring for 10 years. And so uh, I, I just enjoy uh, serving God and serving people. I really love people. Is your family always been in the church, very active in the church? Or this is just really come from you, like God gave you this message that I want you to serve my church? Actually, I grew up in church uh, and, and um, I, as a child, uh -huh. and then I became an adult, and I kind of left the church for a, a few years, <laughs> and then <laughs> I eventually found my way back to the church and became very active in uh, Christian ministry. Uh, as a first, I started off as a teacher, uh, teaching Bible lessons and teaching Sunday school, and then for the past... Uh, 20 years I've, I've been in ministry as a minister and 10 years as a pastor. Wow. I, I mean, do you have to go to school for it to be uh, in the ministry or being in a, being a pastor? Do you have to study theology or? Yes, I have a bachelor's degree in theology uh -huh. and um, I'm always taking uh, continuing education classes uh, to upgrade and advance my Bible training, mm -hmm. um, so, and I uh, graduated from the seminary <clears throat> approximately four years ago. Um, oh. in, in, in the Zion, it was a, a Zion Seminary and Baptist College in Modesto, California. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you actually here in California longer in your lifetime, much longer. Yeah, yeah so I've been in California for <laughs> over fifty years. <laughs> oh, okay. So you're a surfer. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, always, they always think that everybody in California knows how to surf, you know? <laughs> so, okay, so being a ministry in El Beto, uh, what do you think about what's happening now in our generation, the younger generation? Is Dr. King's message still applies to the younger generation? Well, I think the message applies to the younger generation. I'm not sure if the younger generation is hearing his message. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if they, if there was more, ex if they had more exposure mm -hmm. to his message, and mm -hmm. I think then it would make a difference because it's in their eyes, it's kind of uh, they don't see it as being rele relevant for the for today's times. Mm -hmm. uh, one reason our young people don't really embrace some of our histor our historical heritage is because they never had to go through the struggles mm -hmm. of the of the which the civil rights movement yes. have, have made provisions. So they don't have anything to compare it to. So it's sort of it's not really tangible for them. And so the the challenge is to help them understand. Uh, how important it is. It is because with Dr. King's generation, um, activism was very important. But nowadays, a different kind of activism. Yeah. You know, it's more political than anything else. Yeah. And can we change that? You know, how can we have the young generation to understand? It might be a different concept, but it's still, it's about the struggle. It's about diversity is about you know humanity and, and and being in the church to learn more about what God's message kind of thing so how do you deal that changes in, in dealing with today's ministry well one of the challenges uh, and and one of the strategies that I use mm -hmm. is to I really try to make personal contact as much as possible. Uh, with our younger generation by having one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, sessions with them, mm -hmm. having group sessions with them as well to get their feedback on what mm -hmm. what they feel, what they think, um, and how the church 
how do they feel that the church can play a, a role in their lives? Mm -hmm. And if they see the church as being significant and what can we do yes. to help make the message of God uh, easier for them to understand? Yes. And so that's my one of the approaches that I use uh, in addition to prayer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. So um, as one of the leading pastors in the Bay Area, what are you looking forward to seeing change in San Francisco and the Bay Area that may increase the attendance in the church? I would love to see more families, uh, more uh, fathers and mothers and children. Yes. One of our the deficits in our church churches mm -hmm. is a lack of of the of the family structure. Yes. Um, the church now seems to be primarily uh, mostly seniors, mm -hmm. and maybe their grands or great grandchildren. Yes. But the parents of the children. The, the young adult generation, mm -hmm. I, I would love to see them, the fathers and mothers, more involved yes. in, in, in worship and, and, and in learning about what, you know, what, um, how much God, what he has for them, um, how to understand the ways of God. I would love to see them more engaged in the Christian education aspect. Yes. And so that's that's one of the things that's a passion for me is trying to encourage them uh, to connect, connect, mm -hmm. connect with God through the study of his word, the study of his Bible. And so, yeah. so I'm learning, I'm learning uh, how to communicate better uh, with the younger, with the young adult generation, generation Z, generation X. <laughs> Gen <laughs> generation Y. <laughs> uh, X, Y, Z? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What happened to A, B, C? <laughs> uh, I think that went with the boomers, the baby boomers. <laughs> that was the A, B, C's. <laughs> yeah. So alphabets. So I don't know why they, they, they chose um, X, Y, Z. Yeah. You know, they, it, it, it's amazing whoever yeah. started that. Yes, you know? yes. But, um, Okay, one thing about Reverend is, you know, it, nowadays there's a lot of reality show. And yeah. I don't know if you've seen, there was one reality show from L.A. about pastors. Yeah. And what do you think about that? Is is that going to be a positive uh, a way of expressing or, or reaching out the younger generation or that kind of take up the message of being a pastor? I take thought, I thought that that program had both pros and cons. Um, there were some good things that came uh, to see some of the younger pastors uh, being able to speak about their faith mm -hmm. and speak about you know, how God is, is has intervened in their lives. Yes. And then there was this. The other part of that was uh, some of it had seemed to be kind of colored with uh, commercialism. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the 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 glamour and the commercialization of of ministry can really be misleading to people, and they can they can they can focus to see it more as entertainment than they see it as a way of living. It is. It yeah. is. Yeah, it's yeah. taking away the message that yeah. Bible reading the Bible and reading or this or or learning the Word of God. It's more important yeah. than being on television or something. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's the negative part of it. And you're right about that. Yeah. But um, on the latter note, uh, what kind of sports do you like? <laughs> well, I, I like basketball. I played basketball in high school. Oh. And so I, I I still have a love for basketball. And of course, you know, my favorite basketball team is uh, the Warriors. Oh, <laughs> I was so, waiting for like the Lakers. Yeah. Or is it gonna say the yeah. King? <laughs> no, the, the Warriors. The Warriors. The Warriors. So, I, I love it. I love basketball, I, but I like I like other sports: football, golf, uh -huh. uh, soccer. You know, I, I like uh, sports as a way of it's kind of a way of relaxing. Yes. Uh, 
Yes, it is. And since that Super Bowl is coming up, yeah. so are you looking for 49ers? Oh, uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was I waiting it, for the answer to, who? which one is it? it <laughs> I, think it I, I think it could be detrimental for me to say that I was rooting for the Lions. For the Chiefs. <laughs> for the Chiefs. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. The Lions was last Sunday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's right. Uh, Thank you. Know, you. Know, yeah, no, yeah so, <laughs> so it's a, when you're in, in Rome, you do you do like the Romans do. So if I'm in I'm in Cal uh, San Francisco, I'm rooting for the 49ers. If I'm in yeah. Los Angeles, I'm rooting for the Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you just like me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, forever that the team is, you know. Yeah. Okay, you know, oh, yeah. oh, Ron James, you yeah. know, you. And then you go, oh, Curry. I mean, yeah, oh. that's it. That's it. That's why <laughs> I have a hard time watching you sometime when they're competing with each other. Think, okay, yeah. which one are we going to root for? Yeah, you know? that's what yeah. I said. Because I don't want to get beat up. I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's what I'm saying. You no, know, they dangerous. You know. Yeah, you really have to be careful, you know. But um, okay. In the in the Bible, where we go again, going back to the the serious note. Yeah. And uh, so, in the Bible, do you really have to read the whole entire Bible? It's it's a different kind of Bible. It's a Saint James. Yeah. See, I'm yeah. Catholic, so yeah. our 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 Bible is a little bit different than yeah. you. You're Baptist, right? You're Baptist. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it's Saint James Bible. King James Bible. King oh, James. King, King James. James. King James. Yes. Because oh. yes. Saint, because Catholic, you can tell. Catholics are the saints, yeah. <laughs> King James. Yeah, yeah. King, King, <laughs> yeah. King, King James was the, the first uh, translation of the Bible from Greek to English. Oh. And that was during the days when uh, King James was the king of England. And he endorsed the Bible, mm -hmm. but he had the Bible written to be translated from Greek to English because uh, they had made he had made uh, Christianity a state religion. Actually, started with actually started with the Romans before the Catholic Church. <laughs> wow! Yeah, wow. and so once Christianity became a state religion, then Christianity was promoted by the king. Mm -hmm. And the king made sure that everyone had access to the Bible in the English version. So that's the the, the, the version that we read in the Bible is the old English version. Mm -hmm. And that's why the D's and the Dows and the Dust. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why all the, those those terms that we don't use in modern language today. That's true. So that was and established. Established by King James. By King James. The king and of so England. Yeah. Oh, okay. So what would you like to say being a pastor to the people that are watching us today? What kind of encouragement can you give them, a message that you can give them, you know, uh, the encouragement message that you yes, can give Yes, yes. Certainly. I'd like to encourage the uh, people that are watching to know that whenever, even though things sometimes may seem dismal, and oftentimes they do, uh, don't lose hope because as we go through the cycle of life, there are moments and periods of times we could go through dark periods. Yes. And then as we go through those dark periods, our faith grows stronger. Yes. And our faith grows stronger because during those periods, we learn to reach out for a power that's greater and higher than us. Yes. And those dark periods help lead us to find the light. And, and when you're in darkness, the only way out of darkness is to find the light. Yes. It's like walking into a dark room. Yes. And when you first walk into the room, if there is no light, yes. you just kind of feel your way through the room. Yes. But when you find the light, then you can walk uh, direct and walk with confidence in, into the room. And that's the same way um, that we, as we go through this journey of life, um, when we uh, are walking through this journey and we don't know or not sure uh, how life is, what our destiny is going to be and how things are going to be, we can turn on the light and that light is Jesus Christ. 
Yes. By reaching out to Christ, he can become the light for our lives. And he's promised, he's promised if we have our faith and trust in him, that he would lead us and guide us and direct us along the way. And that whatever we face, that he would always be there to protect and guide us and to provide the direction that we need. So there's hope. Even, yes. even when things look dismal, um, there's still hope. But the hope is not in mankind. The hope is in a power greater than man. And that's yes. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So I want to encourage everyone to try Jesus. If you haven't tried him, at least give him a try. And, and if he try it, as they say, try it, and you might like it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you like it, continue like it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> But well, thank you so much, Reverend yeah. McNeil. Oh my yeah. God, those very nice, kind words. Yeah. Uh, would you like to uh, give a shout out to anyone in your family or friends? Or I just uh, want to say to those that are listening, um, just continue to keep the faith mm -hmm. and know for certain that your prayers are not in vain. Yes. Amen. God does answer prayers. Yes. And since this is the first weekend of Black History Month, um, mm. of course, we would need a prayer from you. And um, before we end and say goodbye, I just want to say thank you so much for blessing us with your presence today. And um, I hope everyone heard what you said or the, the positive note that you just gave us. And hopefully, you know, a lot of people will go back to the church. Because there we will really need that message, you know. Yes, Everyone needs that message. Yes, because we need encouragement nowadays. I mean, so many things going on. And that yes. little encouragement, that 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 message that you can give to people that are needed it, they really need it. You know, they need to be there to listen to it and to accept it. Yes. And um, yes. I hope, I really hope encourage more people to, to join in because of yes. you. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I want to also um, yes. <laughs> and to the El Bato church family. Thank you. Okay. And, the first lady. And, and of course, my beautiful bride, uh, uh, my first lady, Brenda McNeil. Yes. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. And I just want to thank uh, first lady Brenda for uh, letting us borrow you today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, then I'll close in prayer then if that's... Okay, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Okay, Father God, we thank you for this conversation. And we pray that what we discussed uh, would be a blessing uh, to those that have opportunity to uh, view and to hear it. And we ask you to continue to bless her to spread the, the word and to spread joy and to encourage others and uplift many that may not know, uh, may not be able to see their way through life, but help us all to be an encouragement one to another. And thank you for the many things that you have already done for us that we can that we have as evidence that you're real. We ask that you bless uh, this nation Bless our leaders of the nation. Bless our church leaders, our pastors, and our, those that work in your service. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name for everything. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Okay. All right. God bless. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> okay. Si Orlino de la Cruz ay kapitan po ng Patal Pinto sa dapat uh, pinatubo uh, nagpapasalamat po ako sa Aita Tribe uh, Foundation nagpapasalamat po ako uli ng sa mga bigay niyo po dito dito po ay lumiwanag na po ang kon namin po community namin po nulit ko lang po nagpapasalamat ako sa inyo po Ay mas pasalamat kami po sa nagtutulong sa amin po sa Aita Foundation po. Ngayon lang po kami naka ano ng ilaw na maliwanag po.
Dito sa pata, lapit to po. Thank you po. Ito po yung mga kasama namin, nag-install ng solar dito sa sityo. Dayday. Ayan si Konsyal. Ayan si Joseph. Goryo. Si Goryo. Si Commander. Si Commander ka. Ito si Kapitan. Ayan si Pangkok. Ayan si Ate Parina. Ayan ang cooker namin, no? Si Ate Parina. Ayan, no? Dito kami sa Sitio Daiday. Ayan, no? Sitio Daiday. Ayan. Ayan, no? Na? Mamili, pili ka ba? Ayan sila. Nandito kami ngayon. Nagluluto. Ayan, no? Ayan yung asawa ni Kap. Ayan sila. Ayan yung mga yan. Maliwanag na sa labas. Good morning everybody, nandito po kami ngayon sa Sitio Daiday Nag-install ng solar panel Ayan sila o oh. Ayan si Kagawat Menus ng Sitio Daiday Ayan si Pangkok Ayan Ayan dito Bilal ako yata dito po kami natulog. Super lamig. Parang nasa Tagaytay. Ayan. Ayan. Ayun po yung pinatubo. Yung may pag. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a good friend of mine. I've known her for a very long time. Of course, she's younger than me. She's probably like, I don't know, one year younger? No. <laughs> Way far younger than me. <laughs> so, you know, I'm only 25. So she's probably, what, 21? <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you a good friend of mine, Nisha Brown. She's an author. She's a podcast host. And also a a what a stage play artist. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Nisha. Hi, Nisha. Hi. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you, thank you for joining us today. And I know a lot of people because a lot of people talk about your podcast. So, mm -hmm. I just want can you tell us a little bit about your podcast first of all? Yes, yeah, so I have a podcast called The Hot Garbage True Crime Edition, and it's on Spotify, Apple, any podcast platform. And what it is, is we talk about different true crime cases that has happened over the years. So we talk about recent ones. We talk about ones that's all the way back in the past. And my co-host and I, Buddha Badass, we actually, you know, host this podcast. And um, the difference in this podcast is it's kind of a comedic vibe to it as well. So he kind of asked the comedic relief that we need because we're talking about a lot of horrendous things that have happened. Oh, really? And yeah. you drive around and, and see what's happening in your neighborhood? No, no, no. We I, I just do the the research. So a lot of stuff didn't happen in my neighborhood. Like, for example, we've covered Jeffrey Dahmer. We've covered Richard Ramirez. Sometimes we cover some of the smaller, lesser known cases. So there's a variety of cases that you know we've covered and uh, actually we haven't covered any hometown ones but I do a lot of research on these cases I'm actually a true crime junkie myself so I, you know it helps that I have a lot of knowledge of these cases mm -hmm. and just recently I was on a to be a documentary about Dahmer as well called Fresh Meat Killing Dahmer so that I have a lot of knowledge about that as well wow this has been your passion to really get into the crime you should have been an investigator I know, you know, it's crazy because I really just started uh, listening to true crime in the past couple of years because, mm -hmm. you know, I had I just was doing uh, true crime just to, you know, I started listening to different podcasts and then I was like listening to it. I was like, I kind of want to be an investigator or an attorney. That was my thing. I was like, I feel like I know enough now to go to law school or something because there was so many things <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, about like the justice system and the injustice <laughs> In the justice system, I knew none of this before I became a true crime junkie. Yeah, what do you think about the what's going on now with our justice system? I know that a lot of uh, your generation right now is really wondering: is there any change from the 
time that Dr. Martin Luther King talked about justice, injustice in, in, in the United States. What do you think about it now? Is, did it change? Well, I don't feel like, honestly, uh, researching it, I don't feel like there has been much change only because, you know, I feel like it, uh, the criminal justice system doesn't have a, just doesn't have a lot of people, only the people of color in prison, but it's also about classism as well. Like, for example, if you're poor, middle class, low income, you can't afford a good attorney, you can't afford to have the best represent you, you know, yeah. so you typically having to plea out your cases and do time that a rich person or a wealthy person probably wouldn't do for the exact same crime. And this was one of the things that really flabbergasted me is just the major injustice when it comes to, you know, what, you know, the, the wealth and the non-wealthy, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was the whole thing, you know, it really like flabbergasted me. And I didn't know that a lot of people that's on death row are innocent as well. That was another thing that flabbergasted me. It's true. It's very true. And if you look at it, it's like 75% in jail are African American. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because as, you, as you're right, you know, they have no, yeah. uh, 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 they have no good lawyers. They don't have the money to invest to, to, uh -huh. to represent them. Uh -huh. And, and so, oh, let's talk about the books that you wrote. You wrote how many books now? You wrote about six, seven uh -huh. books. Yeah, so I'm on my ninth book that I'm editing right now, and they're all available on Amazon. Oh, like... <laughs> yeah. I'm an urban fiction author. Yes, and and uh, what are the titles of the books? Because they're all really interesting titles. Yes, my newest one is Functional But In Love With The Cocaine, and that's the one, so I'm working on part two. And that one is going to be a two-book series because it takes place, the first one takes place when the the kids are teenagers, and this last one I'm working on, now they're adults, and that's going to finish the series. Mm, wow. So th did you do the research also, or you you know someone that's struggling in cocaine or something, that, in drugs? Or well, I do. Yeah, I did do some research, but I have known people that have been in their addiction as well. And, you know, so I channeled a lot of that as well as just my imagination. Yes. OK, so because I know you just love to write ever since I met you, you, you that's when you started writing and you just continued on. Mm -hmm. And it's more about personal writing. Right. It's all about personal issues. Nothing. About, yeah. Nothing about mysteries or or scary. It's all about, yeah. yes, it's all about people that you know, that you wrote about. Um, so when it comes to the play, you said you're going to have a play for you, sir. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to play called A Clown in the Prayer Closet, and that's going to be at Hiram Johnson High School, June mm -hmm. 1st. And I play as a character called Millie Ann. And, you know, it's a Christian play, so I play as the wife and the matriarch of the family who has a teenage <laughs> daughter as well. So my, my teenage daughter, you know, is kind of going out into the world and not necessarily doing what she's supposed to be doing. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm struggling with trying to, you know, have a facade for the church, but meanwhile, my household is falling apart. So that's really Really interesting. Hopefully, you can make it as well. June first, that that'll be on a Saturday. So I look forward to seeing. You. Oh yes, me too. And it's going to be in Sacramento, right? Correct. Yeah, by Hiram Johnson. And Hiram Johnson. And this is not your first play. You 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 had plays before. You have stage. Yeah. Plays. I was actually in a Raisin in the Sun. Have you read that book? Um, I have to be honest. No. <laughs> yeah. Or or seen the movie? What it's so good. Right? It, it's called A Raisin of the Sun. I played as Benita, which was one of my favorite characters to play because that's like one of my favorite books. And that takes place, I think, in the 40s. It's an African-American family, very low income, and the dad just died. So he left this huge life insurance, which was like $10,000. And, you know, back then that was a lot of money. So yeah, each exactly. member of the family had what they wanted to do with it. You know what I mean? And I won't give it all away, um, but basically... Yeah. I played as Benita, which was the daughter, the headstrong daughter who, who wanted to be a doctor. I didn't want to get married and, you know, be a housewife, which was what the traditional women was supposed to be. I wanted to be a doctor. So mm -hmm. it was a really good play. It's a classic. I, I encourage anybody to, you know, see it when it comes back. Yes. I mean, it's, it's perfect that they gave you that role. Because Thank you, you. played that role. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a strong woman. Thank you. You know, Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> so, 
So my God, you're so busy. Every time I, I talk to you, you're doing a play, you're doing, you're writing a book, you know, and now you have your podcast. Oh my God. So tell us again the title of your podcast, my dear. Hot Garbage True Crime Edition. And that's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that, you know, you can listen to podcasts at. Oh, okay. Well, you know, do you want to give a shout out to anyone that you know or something out there in the neighborhood? Yes, I want to give a shout out to all my trash pandas. We, we call our listeners our trash pandas because we're hot garbage. I want to give a shout out to everyone that supported me and even my other podcast friends that really have been in my corner. Like, check out the Tea is Toxic as well. My friend AJ is always in my corner and One Nothing with Amanda, David, and Rachel. Those are amazing people. And this is, you know, my podcast community. And also check out Death Row Diaries with my friend um, Bill and Matt as well. I just want to give them a shout out because this is my community and I feel like they're part of the reason why I'm successful. Yes, it is. I mean, because you have your uh, outside your own family, you also have a family out in show business. You mm. are really in show business with a yeah. project, an artist and all that. And I can't uh, wait to see you one day in Hollywood, girl. Oh, thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> you should be in Hollywood. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> you can act. I mean, I'm telling you, you have the personality. You well, know? you're amazing as well. <laughs> you're going to be in Hollywood right with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know maybe we should go to the Oscar next year. Right. Know? Oh, my gosh. I would love to. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> we need to sign it. Oh, we got to sign up a little early, though. But I'm just so proud of you. Uh, really, you, you've grown. I know you're only 21, but you've grown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, really proud of you and your kids and so one in college and one is a a, 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 a student mm -hmm. in high school and they now just already studying college subjects and you know oh my god I, I'm just I'm thrilled I'm really thrilled keep it Thank going you. keep an inspiration to a lot of um, single mothers out there Thank you. Well, we love you, Susan. Thank you so oh, much. We love you too. I love you. And hope to see you again and maybe act with you next time. You know, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and make sure everybody follows my uh, my uh, Instagram, Hot Garbage Show. Yes. Yes. And we never know. Someone might see you like Oprah and anybody. You never I know. Don't know. That's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, my dear. Good luck. God bless you. And I love you. Thank you. Love you too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. To honor the Black History Month, it is important to educate ourselves on the Black LGBTQ plus folks who paved the way. Here are some of Black influencers who made a prominent impact to the LGBTQ community. Marsha P. Johnson. I'm not sure if I'm related to her. Was an outspoken transgender rights activist liberation activist, self-identified drag queen, performer, and survivor. She was one of the central figures in the historic Stonewall Uprising of 1969. Marsha worked closely with her friend Sylvia Rivera in fighting for trans rights, and together they formed the Street Transgender Action Revolutionaries, it means STAR a radical political organization that provided housing and other forms of support to homeless, queer youth, and sex workers in Manhattan. Barbara Jordan was a lawyer, educator, and politician who was a leader in the civil rights movement. She became the first black queer woman to be elected to the Texas Senate in 1966, elected to Congress from Texas in 1971, best known for her powerful opening statement at the House Judici Judiciary Committee um, hearings during the impeachment process against Richard Nixon. She also delivered a keynote address at the 1976 Democratic National Convention and broke the glass ceiling in many ways throughout her life. Alvin Ailey. After he went to the Philippines and my mom saw his performance, he was a dancer, director, and choreographer and activist. Alvin founded the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, AAADT. His work fused theater, 
modern dance, ballet, and jazz with black vernacular, creating hope-fueled choreography that continues to spread global awareness of black life in America. At Ailey's choreographic masterpiece, Revelations, is recognized as one of the most popular and most performed ballets in the world. In 2014, at Ailey was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his influential work in bringing dance to underserved communities. I hope, I know that was a lot, huh? <laughs> but stay tuned. Don't go anywhere, I have some more. I would like to thank my amazing guests today. Start off with director Kevin Peabody and his choir for the rendition of the Black National Anthem. And of course, the blessings from um, our pastor for today, Pastor Kiva McNeil from El Beto Church in San, in San Francisco. And of course, my girl, <laughs> Nisha Brown, the, an author, podcast, host and also a, st a stage play artist. Thank you PHLV radio team led by Johan Sison. Good job guys. Thank you again. And of course, a special thanks to all of you, my online family and friends for sticking by with me, for, for watching me. Don't forget to subscribe and also make some comments because I always need your comments and, and your views and I would like to hear from you. But today I would like to leave you with some simple note. Let all celebrate Black History Month in unity and compassion. All right? So don't forget to spay your, and, and neuter your pets, you know, to help population control. Again, love, peace, and joy. God bless you all. See you soon. Bye. Bye.